I thought there was going to be a podium, so there goes my speech. Uh, I'm also probably the only brewer in America today wearing makeup. Uh, it actually has nothing to do with the cameras or the prepping in the green room. It's just personal choice, but whatever. Um, anyways, I'm Sam Kellagioni. I'm owner and founder of Dogfish Head uh, Brewery. Um, the talk's about reinventing beer, uh, but more, exp more sort of generally about our opportunity sort of as, as creative people to look backwards as often as we look forward to create the future because so much that our ancestors have done in hundreds of thousands of years have been so creative and we're always thinking, oh, we gotta look forward to what's next. Uh, and I've kind of found in my, my career path that I've gained as much opportunity to express myself creatively looking backwards as I have forwards. So before I talk specifically about some of those creative opportunities we've had, is there a way I can get that slide there somehow? I don't know how. Um, Awesome. Uh, this is my one slide, so I've done the really hard part. <laughs> my work is done here. Um, um, so at any rate, I was an English major in college, which is kind of a strange way into a very science and chemistry-rich uh, career, um, and, and a business career as well. And you know, I, I, but I often say there's, there's, you know, as a, I was a writer, and I loved writing in high school and college. And I, I, I've said before, there's, there's probably no better example of a work of fiction than a business plan. Uh, you know, <laughs> really, banker, I, I wrote this, I'm gonna make it come true now. Uh, and any business success story is really the story of a bunch of people gathering around a, a fictitious story and making it uh, come true. So it's actually a, a pretty great perspective to come into business from. And also storytelling to me is absolutely germane to establishing a brand, you know, a story is a captivating, well differentiated uh, uh, product or service, and and so we're always trying to hone uh, our our stories to uh, captivate people about what we're doing. But when I was 24 and was a homebrewer, I was living in New York, taking some writing courses at Columbia had that euphoric moment when I brewed my first batch of homebrew, that this is what I want to do in my life, I want to be a brewer. Stood up in front of all my roommates, told them that. Uh, my next two batches sucked, but I already told them all I was going to open a brewery. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't want to be a liar, so I kept trying to do it. And uh, in that era, the internet was there, but I wasn't aware of it, so I was going to New York City's public library and doing LexisNexis searches and learning about that first sort of generation of craft brewers that were out there. So that would be, in the early 90s, folks like uh, Sam Adams and Sierra Nevada. And I was thinking is of, of us getting into business and how hard it'd be as a 24-year-old guy to raise the money, I knew I was going to have a big advertising or marketing budget uh, to be able to stand up against them and, and build a brand. Um, so I said, well, how can I do something distinct from what's already out there? And as I looked at that first generation of craft brewers and researched their work, I saw that they were making these beautiful, flavorful, wonderful beers that were generally referencing old world existing styles. In the case of Sam Adams, a German lager. In the case of uh, Sierra, an awesome uh, American interpretation of an English pale ale. So that led us to the, the, the opportunity. And, and, and as I did that research, I also saw that craft brewing as a, as, a, as a niche that was growing was really just a niche within a greater uh, uh, group of businesses that were growing that were sort of the first wave of local vor artisanal food businesses, be it local coffee roasteries or uh, bakeries uh, and th those sorts of things, farmers markets. So the way that I kind of got into figuring out how we were going to differentiate ourselves on a tiny budget was this ideal of off-centered ales for off-centered people. Um, and uh, that's actually a shortened version of a pretty relatively short Emerson quote, it's only a few sentences, so I'll say it, which is, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name goodness, but must explore if it be goodness for himself. And so that couldn't fit on a six pack, so we sh <laughs> shorten it to Austin and Dale's for Austin and people. But it means the same thing, which is, <laughs> I think that's what he was trying to do there. With but it means the same thing, which is don't live after the status quo. You know, create your own path, and if it's a worthy path, people will join you on that path, and hopefully that path will grow enough to sustain what you've, what you've uh, chosen to do. So right out of the gates, we opened our brewery in, a, in our restaurant in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, about two, two and a half hours from here. Two reasons. I was hopeful that by having two revenue streams, one from the food side, one from the beer, if one didn't work so well, I could offset those challenges uh, with the other. And more importantly is knowing we were going to be brewing these very off-centered ales that were 
uh, referencing the entire culinary landscape for ingredient opportunities, um, I knew that it was really important that we had we could engage the consumer at the point where they were trying it, so that we could say, "Hey, this is not a pale ale. This is not a lager. This is a beer made with raisins and beet sugars, and it was designed to go with the steak." And and they're going to be rustic and 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 raw and rough, unfiltered, unpasteurized beer. So we wanted to couple that with very rustic. Uh, food. So everything we cooked was over a wood grill. Again, looking backwards is an opportunity to look forward. All of our ancestors, uh, before there were microwaves, were cooking over an op open flame. So that's how we chose to, to, to marry the food uh, to the beer. And, and, and that, that, that dialogue that we had from, with the customer right from the get-go has informed our whole journey. And today, 17 years on, like when we started in 95, we were the smallest commercial brewery in America. I was, building, I was brewing 10 or 12 gallons at a time out of converted kegs in the corner of my restaurant. And the beers were very different. And the average beers made with four ingredients, ours tend to be six ingredients. The average beer is about 4.5% alcohol. Ours tend to be nine. And we started doing beers like that back then. And struggled and, and to find an audience. Um, and you flash forward to now, we are the uh, largest craft brewery in the mid-Atlantic. Our company will do about $52 million in sales this year, and we're really proud of our growth, but I'm more proud of the fact that we haven't had to differentiate, or we haven't had to you know, go off the course of that off-centered path since the day we opened. Still today, leaving our loading dock, you know, 10,000 cases or so a day, the average case leaving our loading dock is 9% alcohol and made with six ingredients. But we've had a very strange uh, trip in, in between. Um, and so as we, as we came to market, and I'd done my research on that first generation of breweries, and we tried to differentiate ourselves the way we did, even in beer festivals in the mid-90s, we were kind of looked upon as heretics and, and freaks. Uh, what, did, what did you bring this time? You know, the beer with the, the pumpkin in it or the chicory in it or the maple syrup in it. And, uh, you know, that we were screwing with tradition by, by opening up the whole culinary landscape to beer. So that got me to do further research, not just as far back as the 30-year history of the craft brewing movement, but to say, well, wait a second, I'm going to look further back and do more research on the beer industry. Um, and so then kind of all points in c commercial beer world lead back to uh, uh, 1516, which is the year the Bavarians wrote the Rheinheitsgebot, which is the Bavarian, Bavarian Beer Purity Act, which basically they, they ma mandated legally that beer could only be made with water, hops, and barley. Louis Pasteur had, had yet to look under a microscope, so yeast was a given in, uh, in, the, in that equation. And that's a war that the Bavarians have, have won. Uh, because still today, 99% of the beer sold commercially around the globe is either directly or indirectly referencing the Rheinheitsgebot. I say indirectly because the large commercial breweries today, the industrial big light lager brewers, use a lot of corn and rice, which are cheaper crops than, ad, than, uh, than, than barley, uh, to make their beer you know, more refreshing or lighter, depending on how you look at it. Um, but again, they're still referencing that existing style. So then that got me looking further back in history, and that's when I started reading about uh, you know, ancient and medieval ingredients. And long before beer had been homogenized and uh, cr made monochromatic, every culture around the world brewed beers with whatever was you know, beautiful and natural and indigenous and grew under the ground that they lived on. And so that led us to do some early braggots or bragos, which are medieval uh, English drinks that are hybrids of meads, which are fermented uh, honey and, and ales uh, and they, plums in them. We did an ancient beer, uh, sati, very early on. We did ancient African tejas, which are made with honey and geisha root for the bittering instead of hops. And on that journey, it again gave us that opportunity to expand that dialogue, not just with consumers, but with the entire beer community to say, you know, you're calling us a bunch of heretics, and yet we're the most, you could say we're the most traditional brewers out there in that long before the tradition of the Rhein Heitzgebot, the tradition was whatever grows and you can access that's awesome, use it to brew. Um, so those early experiments that we did on our own led us to some wonderful uh, relationships, uh, particularly with uh, uh, archaeologists and uh, molecular archaeologists, that led to uh, a number of, of pretty innovative uh, beers that actually spend more uh, of their, their innovations more based looking backwards than forwards. And so using these as really uh, examples of um, reinventing really since a long, long time ago, uh, growing, going kind of chronologically, uh, the most ancient would be 
uh, Chateau Giahu, uh, which is a beer we, we brew. The, it was um, basically a, a, a site in China, so well preserved that it had been uh, compacted into a, a band of metal. So as the archaeologists dig through it, there was still literally liquid uh, in some of these shards of, of crockery. Uh, so from that evidence, we were able to uh, kind of uh, reverse engineer what people were drinking 7,000 years ago. That dig site is even more uh, critical to human history because it's also the oldest known site that held musical instruments made from birds' bones. With So you know these people were having a hoot nanny that night. They're <laughs> rocking, they were rocking out, and they were drinking. Um, and what's also really interesting is all of these ancient beverages are hybrid beverages with multiple sources of fer fermentable sugars. And yet, you know, here today, 99% of beer, so beer has to be this. Really, it was about what can we work, what can we make that can work in harmony with each other for ingredients. So in the case of Jiahu, um, it has hawthorn fruit, which is similar to pomegranate, uh, honey, sake yeast, and sake rice. The other thing that's really special about, about that beer is 7,000 years ago, that's, or, or, or 7,000 BC, 10,000 years ago is basically the point when we, as humans, uh, reinvented ourselves. Because previous to that era, we were mostly hunting and gathering nomads. And yet, right around that era, we were settling down. Why were we settling down? We figured out it's a lot easier to grow something and wait around and watch it come up and eat it than it is to chase it down and kill it and eat it. Um, so those earliest crops of, of rice and corn and barley is what changed us and moved us from these uh, individuals into society. So you can leave here today saying one thing you learned is beer is, is responsible for society as we know it today. <laughs> Your one takeaway, um, but uh, so so that's that's a story that we're really proud of. Uh, next oldest would be uh, Theobroma, a little closer to us, Central South American uh, cocoa uh, beer recipes. Um, this is uh, state, the saying "drunk as a monkey" actually comes from monkeys coming upon cracked open uh, cocoa pods that have gotten rain and wild yeast in them. Sugars get exposed and ferment, and the young monkeys d did get drunk. Um, this this beer we work with a tiny little artisanal chocolate maker out of uh, uh, St. Louis called Askinosi Chocolate. Uh, and uh, before humans were fighting over oil-rich land, they were they're fighting over the most cocoa-rich uh, lands. And this is an Aztec cocoa-growing region. Um, am I over time already? Oh, what did that say? That just malfunctioned? See why I don't do slides? This freaking technology. Uh, will you yell at me when there's a minute left or something? Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so then we'll go to 7500 BC, uh, which, is one of the, which is probably the oldest of the ancient beers in terms of the chronology of when we did it. Um, uh, we, in terms of working with experts, molecular archaeologists. So Midas Touch is a recipe that was, was discovered in the 1950s. UPenn archaeologists excavated a, a tumulus in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Turkey, believed to belong to King Midas. This one was above, above ground tomb, and, but it was so well preserved as they pulled the rocks away, first thing the archaeologists noticed was they watched the color fade before their eyes, the tapestries that hadn't been exposed to air in, in that long. All of a sudden, the color left the room, and then they just noticed the stink in the room uh, and the legend of Midas being buried with all this gold. In fact, it was a pretty uh, uh, sim simple uh, tomb, crockery in the corner that in the 50s they couldn't analyzed, they just brought it back to uh, Philly, uh, and then him laid out in this ornate wood, wood bed mummy. Um, flash forward to molecular ar archaeology, early 2000s, now they can analyze at a molecular level what that petrified stuff in those tombs were, and we were able to uh, do sort of a liquid time capsule, bring that back, and it's a mixture of saffron, which was used as a local bittering agent instead of hops in Turkey, uh, honey, and, and grapes. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a beautiful beer because it's such a hybrid between wine and beer. And beer has always suffered as sort of the, the, the ugly stepson of, of wine, particularly in, the, in American culture. And a beer like this gives us an op awesome opportunity to amplify that dialogue to say, hey, if you love wine, here's a, here's a beer that we think uh, you'll really uh, love. It's on the, the sweeter side. Uh, a woman earlier gave a great presentation. It was on Matt Lauer show, and it made me rem remember when t the Midas Touch was on uh, the, the Today Show about ten year, eight years ago. And I'm sitting there watching it at home. They're drinking our beer on, t on national television. I'm like, this is awesome. And he goes to carry. He drinks it, and he goes to carry or whatever her name is. He's like, wow, this is actually really good. And she goes, yeah, you know, and it's nice because it's on the sweeter side, so women will like it too. And he goes, you mean I'm drinking chick beer? Um, <laughs> 
And by the time I got to the brewery, like five of my friends who own breweries had left me messages. So oh, you're making the chick beer, Sam. That's good. <laughs> Uh, but at any rate, stories like that, again, a brewery like ours doesn't do any major advertising, but if we can do something so distinct and it tells such a unique story that it can uh, entice People Magazine or the Today Show to cover it, it goes way further than it would if we did have a lot of money and took out a full page ad in the New Yorker and said, this is the best beer in the world, you need to try it. So that's the way our company has grown, is by trying to uh, create stories around these beers, and our, we've found great success as a way into that to look backwards for inspiration uh, as, we, as we move forward and try and put a new, broader definition on beer. Um, and the last one is a, a beer called Sati, um, and it's a beer from Finland originally made with uh, rye, uh, and juniper berries. Our version, we spell it differently with TEA because we have a, uh, a chai tea that we get uh, in individually like, custom blended for us in India to make that beer. And talk about reinventing beer, you know, when, in, in, when this beer was being made in Finland, they were not building metal pots yet. That's how old it was. So how do you boil and sterilize a beer before that? Uh, in that era, you basically make a big fire outside, throw some rocks in that fire. Once the rocks are, are really white hot, you, you fill a wooden vat with beer, and you figure out a way to plop the white hot rocks in the wooden beer, and the heat of the rocks boils that beer. It actually caramelizes on the outside of that rock, and it gives it a really beautiful caramel character. So when we were redoing this beer, uh, the New Yorker was doing a story on, on the craft brewing movement, and they came to watch us for one day. And when they saw us, like, not, you know, we were heating them in, in our brew pub's wood oven or wood grill, and we had mineral-rich rocks that, as they got hot, were exploding in our faces. So eventually, it was us in in uh, skateboard helmets, ski <laughs> ski goggles, and doubled up. Uh, oven mitts, running as quickly as we could from the kitchen of the brewery into the or kitchen into the brewery and plopping them in. And a guy called New York, the writer, up. He's like, I think I'm going to stay here for another week. <laughs> And, uh, and they ended up doing about an eight-page feature, a guy named Burkhart Bilger, on dogfish in their, in their food episode. Um, so again, these are opportunities to captivate people's imaginations as you're exploring creativity by looking backwards and instead of always looking forwards. One forward-looking thought is I have to go to a beer dinner uh, later tonight, so I won't be around for our reception. Thank you guys for, for your attention. Thanks for inviting me. And you can try my beer, our beer at, at the reception. So thank you.